Good morning. Um, thank you all for coming out today uh, to hear the information regarding the final report on the staffing and utilization study. I do have copies for everyone to be able to take after the press conference. After, I will ask that everyone allow the speakers to speak first before and questions will be asked after. Please refrain to all your questions to the staffing study. Any other questions that you may have, please refer them to the PIO Cara Cruz. You all have her email. If not, we can provide that to you afterwards. Now I would like to welcome the Honorable Mayor, Ed Ganey. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, last year, we talked about we were going to do a staffing study because when we came in, we wasn't sure exactly of what our complement was, what our operations was, or anything else. And the last time we had a staffing study was 2005. And as we've done with everything else, we've made sure that we have assessed everything to assure that the directions that we're taking is the direction that's going to move this city forward. So just like we did with the Department of Public Works, just like we've done with the police going around to every zone, asking them what they need, we brought in a staffing study, and I'd like to thank Matrix um, Company for doing it. And the reason for it is to find out exactly how we continue to do right policing, what, what the staffing identifies. Now, let me say this. It's a blueprint that can be changed. This is just a document that we have that puts us in the direction to get us to where we want to go. In regards to this, a lot of what we'll take is from the chief of police. The reason why we waited before we released this is because we wanted a chief of police that was on board, that can interpret it and digest it and be able to talk about which direction and where he thinks there's truth that we can move in that direction, and that's what Chief Scarado has done. So today we are, we are, we are, today we are unveiling the report so that everybody can have it. But I just wanted to set those parameters. One, we had the report, but we wanted to wait till the chief came on so that he had a chance to read it, understand it, tell us what he agrees with, which direction we need to go, and as chief, we will follow that direction. Two, we have not had a report since 2005. This was extremely important because we should always be updating our staffing studies to ensure that we're going in the right direction. We are very comfortable with that. So going forward, this is just another stop in the direction when we talked about right policing that we would do to ensure that we are ready for future generations of police. So I want to thank you for being here. With that, I want to turn it over to the Public Safety Director, Lee Smith. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Also, just want to thank everyone for their patience. We know the staffing study started back in September. Um, we, with the changes in personnel, we also wanted to make sure we had all the information from the officers. You'll see in the study there was a survey that went out to all the officers. We appreciate them for entering and giving their feedback on how they feel about the Bureau. Uh, we went back and forth with Matrix to make sure everything we wanted to cover was in that study. Um, all the concerns we had, we also had them make sure we were looking at accurate numbers. Um, as we all know, between 2020, 2021, in 2022, a lot of things changed around COVID, how many people were in downtown, how many people were working from home. Um, so call volumes changed throughout that time. So we wanted a little time to look at 2022's numbers and consider them before the study went out, uh, which that was done as well. And as the mayor stated, we're looking at this as a roadmap to see where we can do better, where we can be most effective and utilize our resources properly. Uh, we don't wanna create burnout for our officers. We don't want to have them doing unnecessary tasks that can be done by uh, civilians or other units or other bureaus. And we want to ensure um, we're using everybody's time wisely, especially our officers, because we don't want them wearing out, getting tired. Um, so we want to ensure we have all that information. As the chief will probably talk, you know, this gives our new chief a great roadmap to start with and a blueprint to start uh, looking at where we want to go and how we want to move things around uh, doesn't require, it actually shows that we have the right amount. The 900 budgeted is a good amount of officers for us to have. It's a matter of where those officers are placed and how they're utilized that we need to take a look at. Um, but you all, as they state, mayor stated, it, will you all receive a copy? It'll also be posted on our website. Um, so it'll be available for anyone to look at. Um, might take a couple days to get it up on the website, but. I'm sure you all will share it with the public quickly as well. So thank you. 
uh, now bring up Chief Scrato. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, let's just talk about the study, I, I guess, more from a comprehensive point of view as we move forward as Bureau. Uh, the study for me is a great document. Uh, it's a great document for any new chief because it provides the foundation for how I'll move the Bureau forward. Uh, in that, uh, this blueprint is a recommendation and it's not a directive. And in those recommendations, there are things that I strongly agree with and there are a few things that I disagree with. Uh, where I disagree, we will make the best decisions for the Bureau and our community. Where I agree, we'll make strides to implement them. Far too often, studies are completed uh, and no recommendations are implemented in an organization as provided by the study. So in this uh, opportunity, it was an exercise in futility. It, it wasn't something just to be done. It was something that has impact. It gives me the ability to use data to inform my decisions. It gives me the ability to allocate our resources in the appropriate manner. It gives me the ability to stand in front of the men and women that represent the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police and tell them why we're doing these things. And it gives outside perspective on how the Bureau operates. And in that, I find that to have great value. So moving forward, we'll use the study as a tool. We'll use the study as guidance. It is not policy. Uh, so those of you that read into it and then suggest or, or question why we don't move in a certain direction is because it's simply a recommendation. And in those recommendations where we see and I see fit for the Bureau, for efficiency to focus on our four strategic initiatives, and that's the reduction of gun violence, that's community police partnerships, uh, that's our officer wellness, and that's creating a quality of life that's for a positive quality of life for our community. And when we do those four things, that's what we'll use this study for. So at this point, I'll stop. I'll open it up for questions because I think it is relative and important that you have the opportunity to ask them. When you're asking your questions, please identify yourself and what agency that you're representing so I can repeat the question for those who are watching on Facebook um, and other streaming agencies. First question, please. Yes. Hi. So pers I guess sometimes perception is reality, right? So the, the officer overtime is impactful and important to acknowledge uh, that we are mandating, but I believe that is because we don't have our resources allocated in the appropriate places. Uh, data supports a, for example, data supports that 8% of our call volume happens from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. In that, we have 33% of our staff working during that time. So I have an obligation to reassign or at least evaluate our, our resource allocation to ensure that we have our officers working in our peak times and then that would then impact in a meaningful way the way in which we mandate. So using the data from this report, we'll start reallocating our resources in 2024 to ensure that we're aligned with our call volume and again, allowing that data to inform our decisions which will then impact the way in which our officers are mandated at overtime. You're welcome. Sir? Um, Chief, I have... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you're, identify yourself, please. Uh, Rick Earl. Um, Chief, I'm struggling with, I've read through the report, mm -hmm. and I'm struggling with the um, control unit you know, uh, situation there. It looks like the report suggests you could eliminate 188 officers from patrol, and then it says that um, PVP patrol is not only adequately staffed to provide a high level of service, it's exceptionally overstaffed. Uh, how is this overstaffed when you're continuously having officers work overtime, you're holding officers, we hear numerous complaints about not enough officers on weekend shifts and so forth. Um, and then you go to the um, end of the report where they do the survey, and the number one topic from patrol officers is inadequate staffing. How do you reconcile that with the report's recommendation? Well, again, I think that's where we talk about things that I agree with or disagree with the report, right? So the report speaks to the decrease in staffing and patrol operations, but it doesn't say that we should decrease the staff of the Bureau. So it's how it talks about reallocation of those, of those resources, uh, whether it's the community service resources or it's, it's in other parts of the Bureau and in investigations, et cetera. Uh, 
I believe it gives us the, it provides what I think is a minimum staffing, right? Because it compares us to some sister cities uh, and their baseline metrics. And, and so that is a comparable to like average metrics. Well, why would we ever want to be average when we provide excellent police services today? And, and that's, so that is the direction I will continue to take us in and continue to advocate for, is that we're not seeking to hit a baseline, we're seeking excellence. And in excellence, the staffing that we have today, that 900 budgeted staffing is adequate to create excellent policing services. And that's what we'll stay committed to. So in this study, there, uh, so in this study, it does the 188, it speaks to, like right now we have, we have with people on compensation, accommodated duty, military, the departures, and in advance of these two classes that we're hiring this year, uh, we are, we're about 25% to that number, decreased in 25% to that number in patrol operations today. And, and in that, that's, but we know how that impacts the Bureau in a negative way. We know how that impacts patrol operations in a negative way. We're seeing it. We're seeing it in the mandates. We're seeing it in the weekend coverages. So with that, I stay committed to this number of 900. It is the appropriate number for this Bureau. And then we start looking to then take our civilianization processes and get our officers that are in civilian roles back into patrol operations and or in other meaningful areas that impact the Bureau in a positive way. Just, just to follow up on that, so would you agree with reallocating 188 officers from patrol, lowering that from the 400 plus range to 263 as the report suggests? No, I do not. Any other questions, sir? Uh, Charlie Wolfson with Public Source. You, so you don't agree with that 188? Is there a number you do you would want to do? In a reduction? In, or a reallocation. I, I don't want to reallocate any patrol operations because I don't have like when we saw when the report speaks to uh, community-oriented police officers. Well, it speaks to 42 of them. I have no, I, I, I have of the belief that our police department, all 900 men and women are community oriented police officers. And then when we start creating sector designations that will have our patrol operators, our patrol officers that are answering calls on afternoon, in the middle of the night, on, in, during the day, that they all have that same responsibility for community engagement. So it's never gonna be a, an assignment or responsibility of a group as I see it. I don't believe it's beneficial. I don't believe that's what community-oriented policing was designed to do. Okay, and secondly, uh, that same survey found that I think more than 80% of officers felt that city leadership did not support the police bureau. Do you or the mayor have any response to that? I, the, the survey was done in transition years. I support our officers. We are moving in a direction that I am excited about, the officers I talked to today are excited about. I know the mayor supports me and our officers and his actions have shown it. From our contract to the hiring of these new recruits, to upward of maybe 70 officers this year, and the continued commitment to improve our officers' work-life balance. And I'll let the mayor speak to, from his position. Just repeat the question one more time, Chris, please. Um, that survey that the consultants ran found more than 80% of the officers feel that uh, city leadership does not support the police yeah. bureau. We understood that coming in. And so the actions that we took was, I went around to each zone personally to talk to the officers, from zone one to zone six, even inside the bureau here today, to have a conversation about what they need. A lot of the conversation that came up was, one, um, they felt they needed a raise, and I understood that. Secondly, is that they thought that, um, you know, we had a great conversation, a robust conversation around the 60 credits, and you see that we changed that to comprehending and moving inside so that it's the ability to move up, not to get in. Um, so the things that they asked for, we, we were able to deliver a lot of them. And so, you know, lately, I think this is a little bit of a difference now. I think that they're beginning to see that they are supported. You know, the other thing that I promised them that I have not, that I have kept my word to is that I would never criticize them in the public. What I said we would do is those are conversations that we have behind closed doors and continue to build healthy police community relations. Everything that we said we do, we've kept, we've, we, we've kept our word to. Um, and I think that you can ask majority of the Bureau have we done that. And I think that shows in the contract. I think it shows in hiring the chief of police. I think it shows in going around to the zones and having conversations with them. I think that we've done the necessary things to believe that we started a great opportunity to improve the morale in the police. Three more questions. Yes. Kylie Kaczynski, Chief, you said that you didn't 
wouldn't necessarily agree with decreasing the number of patrol officers. Does that mean the Bureau won't allocate officers by zone the way the study lays it out, where zone 1 would have 42, zone 2, 46, etc.? So we will take the data that they provided, but we will add some other measurables to, for instance, there are some of our zones that have high call volumes, but don't have high instances of violent crime, whether it be zone one, zone five, and, and in that, we have to ensure that the calls that require intense police response have the personnel to support it. So some of our zones, are leading in calls for service, but those calls for service are parking complaints. Those calls for service are alarm calls. Uh, and, and in that, I can't allocate the same number of resources to those two instances when we have high instances of gun violence in other neighborhoods that require intense response. So the study doesn't speak to the, to the specific crime, more importantly than that specific response to those certain events. And, and in that, I have an obligation to use that data that they have provided, and then the data that our crime analysts are going to provide relative to crime events, and then base our resource allocation on those issues. We've talked a lot about the stuff you don't agree with in the study. Is there a recommendation that you are going to I, I, I agree with where the study speaks to civilianization. It is very clear in the direction that we need to go, and, and let me be clear when I talk about civilianization. It's not in place of our officers. It's to complement our officers and allow the people that we train and arm and equip to respond to police issues. Those three categories that we say are so important to this city. Reduction of violent crime, specifically gun violence, community police partnerships, and our quality of life issues. And then allow the civilians to sit in those roles and focus on those non-essential police calls for service. Whether it's accidents, traffic complaints, report writing. Things that can be handled much more efficient with civilian, uh, with civilian personnel. No, that does not. Okay. Chief, the, uh, Hold on one second. Okay. Uh, there was another question before Rick Earl, sir. Okay. Yeah, 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 Pittsburgh City paper. Um, obviously, the focus of this is on like the internal and staffing culture. But could you talk a little bit about how you hope that will uh, impact the externals of your policing work and um, what that might look like for citizens? So again, it, it's when we prioritize what we say is important as an organization, it then creates greater community police partnerships, and, and that gives us the opportunity to focus our time and effort toward building trust in our community, making sure our officers are accessible and available to our community, and it's a, it's a strategy that hasn't been done here with fidelity for quite some time. And I'm committed that all 900 men and women for the Pittsburgh River Police are community police specialists. And, and that's what our communities are demanding. That's what they've consistently asked of me at every meeting that I go to, is that our officers are available, our officers are accessible, that we can build trust together and as a collective group, community and police, that we will then have the ability to impact this city, making it the safest city in America. Is there anyone um, in the back, sir? Um, Harrison Hamm about Pittsburgh Union Progress. Uh, the, the police union president last year said that he called the understaffing uh, an absolute crisis uh, for the police department. Uh, how would you reconcile this report with his comments, and what would you tell him now that the, the report does not find that there was understaffing? I said it earlier, I think when I spoke, not today, but in other conversations, the staffing, levels that we have aren't in crises. Uh, I have an obligation to note, I have an obligation to this organization, to this city, to continually review where our resources are allocated. And, and that is what this study provides, is a clear direction of resource allocation. Uh, the city and our personnel are capable of keeping it safe, and, but we will continue to meet the objective of our staffing, our budgeted staffing number of 900, which is why we've committed to the class of 30 that starts on July 24th, and then hopefully another class of up to 40 that will start in November. And this continual hiring to keep us and allow us to meet that number. Uh, so in that, we are committed to that number, but the current role, the current staffing that we have keeps this city very safe on a daily basis. And so I have an obligation to ensure that those resources are allocated in the appropriate place, and that's what this study will provide. Chief, just two quick follow-ups. Um, the, the report also recommends 
um, an aggressive community resource officer program, and it recommends taking 45 of the 188 patrol officers from patrol and putting them into this community resource officer program. Will you do that? No, I disagree with that. That's the part of the sort of, or of the study I disagree with. That is uh, in direct, I guess, conflict of how I believe community policing should look. Uh, I believe it should be the responsibility of every officer that's assigned to our neighborhoods on all shifts, not a select number of officers that work Monday through Friday and are off on the weekends. And then one, one follow-up. Um, the union is saying that the matrix report report is off with uh, citizen initiated calls. They claim there were 146,000 and Matrix only listed 128,000 for a discrepancy of 17,000 that were left off in 2021. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll let you finish your question. Is there, uh, was there an issue with the numbers? The director spoke to that earlier. Uh, that's what we had delayed the report for. We had requested a revisit on the numbers because they used 2021's yeah. calls for service. And in 2022, we answered 143,557 calls for service. And we had 52,572 officer initiated calls, which creates 196,129. So there's a discrepancy of some odd 40,000 40, events. I think in 2021, though, they're suggesting the number was off by about 17,000. Yeah, it, well, 2022, our, our calls for sorry, service. In 21, that is from the report, it speaks, you're correct. It's 100, the, the 2022 calls for services, which would be a better gauge of output, is 143,557 calls for service. And 52,572 officer initiated. Correct. Calls. For 196, that 129. They used in the report? No, that's not the number they used in the report. They used 2021's data. Was there a concern? It's the data that was. It's the data they had at, at the time, which is then why we are why we use. No, the, the, no, the data was correct in 2021. They it, we they reported on 2021's data. We then compared to 22's data, which was what created some of this delay on reporting on providing this report today. Thank you all for coming. I do have the actual report that I'll be providing to you. Uh, and the last word will be with the mayor. Sir. Just real quick, just want to thank everybody for coming. Chief Scarado, thank you for um, making sure that you did a great job in explaining the report. If there's any questions, I know there may be more questions that you have, please reach out to the POs right here. Ms. Cruz, can you raise your hand? Or you reach out to the mayor's office. Um, hey, did anything in the report strike you? I mean, was, was key take what's your key takeaway? My key takeaway of the report was, to be honest, Rick, was just for the first time getting to understand the, the language that's associated with the police, to see the response times and how well the police officers were doing with response times, even in the backup, and even when they're handling situations when they get to the scene, was amazing. And to see that we were performing above, way above average, um, allows me to know just how great of a job they're doing. I mean, I think that, if anything, I know we didn't talk about it because it's, 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 it's the positive part of it, so I know we ain't going to discuss that too much, right? But anyway, like I was saying, when you think about some of the issues that we've talked about, response time, backup time, handling time, the whole night, to know that we were ahead of the curve right then and there just demonstrates the level of professionalism that they have and how they seriously they take their job, and I want to uplift that. Because I think that's something that we should uplift. Of course, we got some issues. That's why we got a chief that's going to move us in that direction. But Rick, you know as well as I do, without this report, we wouldn't even have a starting point. We haven't had a report since 2005. So to have a report right now that allows us to know where we need to go, recommendations, not that this is etched in stone, but recommendations of what we can do is a positive. So when you say, what's my takeaway? My takeaway is the great work that they have done through the years and understanding where we need to go. To me, that's perfect when we talk about handling, response, and backup, because at the end of the day, that's public safety. Thank you all for coming.